like I flew down, I met the guys, we, we got along great. And we decided to, to do a record and, and put it out. And we made The Power of Failing. And I remember before it came out, I was at my home, I was listening to it for the 40 billionth time and thinking, I know a secret that nobody else knows yet and they're about to found out, find out and it's gonna change everything. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, last week I mentioned that I had an announcement today, and that is that my old band Lane Meyer is playing a show on Thursday, December 1st at the Stanhope House in Stanhope, New Jersey. Pre-sale is 15 and if you miss out on that, then it's 20 bucks at the door. Link is in the show notes, or you could just go to the Lane Meyer Band Instagram and uh, click on the link there to go buy some tickets. Crank, a record company, was an independent record label which was started by Jeff Matlow in September 1994. The label played a huge role in the spreading of emo in the mid-90s, according to Alternative Press magazine. The label's first release was a 7-inch by Vitreous Humor, released under the name Gearhead Records. After that, all releases were issued as Crank. This is a big one for me because I'm a giant Mineral fan, and we definitely talk a lot about Mineral in this this interview, but I really wanted to go to the source of how the fuck that record got out, and Crank was such a significant label back then that I was like, I have to fucking make this happen, so luckily uh, Jeff agreed, which was really cool. There's a point in the beginning where you can hear his dog in the background barking, but he quiets down pretty quick, so it doesn't really stick around. So I know like when you're listening to something, you're like, oh my god, is that going to be around the whole time? And it's not, so I wanted to make a reference now. I reached out to Jeff through LinkedIn and uh, asked him to be in the podcast. He said, yes, I got him on the Skype, and this is what we chat about. His current career is a business consultant, working with James Brown, Mineral, starting his other company, Saul Goodman, why he released a ton of 7 Inches, meeting Brett Gurowitz, Mineral breaking up, the Sensefield Jimmy Eat World Mineral split, the Icarus line, Bright Eyes, and a ton more. Go sign up for his newsletter at buytitleonly.substack.com. I also have a link in the show notes for you. This week's episode is sponsored by the band American Television. American Television are a gritty pop-punk band from the D.C. area that has shared the stage with Piebald, Spanish Love Songs, Dirty Nil, The Copyrights, and many more. Their new song, Moments, is out today on all streaming services and will be featured on the exclusive 12-inch Fest 20 comp, available through Sell the Heart Records and at the Fest in Gainesville, Florida from October 28th to the 30th. Here's a clip from Moments. They also have a music video out, which I'll link to in my This Was The Scene's Instagram story, so you can check it out. American Television plays The Fest, Sunday, October 30th, 9.40 p.m. at Vecinos. That's all I gotta say, so feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk, rock, nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Well, I saw that you're a business coach. Is that the term you like to use, or do you have a different term? Well, yeah, that was kind of a mistake in putting that up. What I do is now I'm a business consultant um, in the sense that I help companies unlock new revenue channels. The reality is when I'm brought into companies to help them find these new revenue channels, it goes to, all right, let's look at leadership and let's look at culture and let's look at processes. And so there's a coaching element on it. And for Two weeks, I thought, okay, well, let me just call myself a coach. And then I realized there's a million coaches out there, and that's not really what I do. So you caught it during those two weeks. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, because I think I saw that on your LinkedIn profile, and I signed up for your newsletter, which I get, I think, like once a week you send it out, yeah. and it's all Every numbered. Monday. So did you start that? I mean, we'll eventually talk about Crank and the origins, but I'm fascinated by this because I, I've hired business consultants or coaches and Matt done mastermind groups and life coaching stuff. So I've been in that world where I've, I've hired people to help me. And in the beginning, before I did that, when I heard the term coach or like life coach, I was always like, get the fuck out of here. But then when I would hire them, it was always something for something very specific where I needed somebody to help me out. And it always worked. And then as the business coaching side, actually the 
first person I had one on one outside of a mastermind group where they they had paired me with somebody. He was uh, this guy Dave Shanebeck. He was the <clears throat> he was the original COO of Babies R Us when they started. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. so he had retired and he wanted to. He was using like um, he was doing a coaching service, like Action Coach. He'd sign up for it, and he found me in a networking group and we worked together. And he's great. We're to this day we're still friends. So I like completely love that whole aspect of what you do because I think a lot of people they don't see. They can't see it from the inside, and so from that outside perspective, it really opens their eyes. But like, it's nice to trust somebody who's been through it, because I don't like people who have a failed business, and then they try to coach you. It's like, I want to see that you did something, because I want to do that myself. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what I, I realized, too. Listen, I, I don't love the term coach. I hired one business coach in my life, and I still... Uh, I'm not happy about it. I, I paid a lot of money and felt like I didn't get any value out of it. So I'm, I'm kind of turned off a little by that. So when I, you know, for those two weeks, I'm like, well, what, what am I doing? I don't even like this. Um, I see the value. Like if you have the right person, there's definitely value. Absolutely. But as you said, you got to have a problem to fix first. So that's what I'm like, all right, what's your problem? If you don't have a problem and you just want somebody to make sure you pick up the phone and call the people you're supposed to call, like, okay, I got to talk to your friends where there are some accountability coaches that do that. But that's not me. I was thinking too, and we're going to jump in this. I'm, I'm really fascinated in how when we talk about you starting the label and all that and up till now, there's going to be certain things where I'm probably going to see like this is where it makes sense of why you're here. I always do that with any interview. I'm like, well, you said at 17, you wanted to do this. And now you're, you know, later on in life where we are now, you're actually doing it and you did it this. So it's always fascinating to me. Am I going to, am I going to cry by the end of this? Probably. Uh, that's my <laughs> yeah. goal is to make you just like, be like, oh my God, that's what happened when I was five. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about my father. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, it's an open, uh, it's an open forum. Do whatever you want. <laughs> but um, I, I'm really happy about this, that I got you on this because of Crank, like, I mean, God, I grew up on that. That was like, it, it's funny to the way that I look at labels or bands or producers or whoever I talk to, they had, I look at them like, wow, you did this thing that like affected me and you had no idea. And from the person at that on their, from their viewpoint, it's kind of like, oh yeah, I, I just really wanted to do this thing. And they, sometimes either they know they had that effect on people or they don't know. It, it's cool to just see how you saw it. Like when we heard I mean, my buddy got mineral when he got power of failing, I mean, that was just like game changer for all of my friends, <laughs> like writing music and the music we listen to. So I'm so fucking fired up for this interview. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> that, that's great to hear that. Cause honestly, uh, when I first heard mineral, I had the same feeling. I'll tell you the story in, in a minute if you want to get there. But, uh, but yeah, I like but I, I definitely understand where you're coming from because I'm the same way. Yeah, uh, yeah. There's just so I can't. Um, there's so much stuff I'm gonna like, you know, just ask questions about. But so the way I structure this is, and I say this every the beginning of every interview. So if someone's been listening for this a long time, they're probably like, I get it. You say this, but but the way I started off, and which I do all interviews, is ask, how did you get involved in the scene in the first place? Uh, <laughs> first of all, I didn't know there was a scene. And until one day I was standing in a basement and realized, oh, there's a scene. I, you know, I started off as a classical, classically trained pianist. So I started playing when I was six. Then, you know, when I discovered girls, I also realized that you can't bring pianos to parties. And so I picked up guitar. Then, uh, you know, I was a DJ and managed bands and had bands. And, and you know, I was going to be a rock star, right? Um, it was It was given. In college, it was around junior year of college where I realized I just did not have talent, but I knew I wanted to be in music. And so I, I decided I'd be in the music business because the business side, I felt like I could succeed in. And I wanted to do A&R, which is talent search. You find the bands, you bring them in, you record the music with them because that's where the uh, frustrated musicians who can't be rock stars go. I, then I got lucky. You know, I worked for, I got an internship with EMI Records then I got hired by A&M uh, Records and, and some others and ended up, you know, being able to work with really cool artists and doing some A&R stuff. Like I was, I was James Brown's point person. Oh, shit. For, 
Yeah. And, you know, worked with Everclear and, and some others. James Brown, like, that's a whole side story, but... I can imagine. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. And basically, nobody else at the company... He was very needy. He liked to talk. And other people were like, Jeff's good with him. Let him deal with it. <laughs> and I was like, it's fucking James Brown. Yeah, I'll talk to the guy all day. Well, did you find that you could talk to him because you are a good listener or like you could see past what other people were getting annoyed by? Uh, I think probably a little of both. I was patient and could listen to whatever his ramblings were. But I also, people really kissed his butt. Like he always insisted on calling people, you know, Mr. Matlow or blah, blah, blah. And I would never take that from him. I'm like, you call me Jeff. Like I'm not Mr. Matlow and I'm not calling you Mr. Brown. You're James or Jim or whatever you want to be called. So I would, you know, just be like me, like, no, that's a bad idea. I recognize he was just another person, right? Yeah, he's got a tremendous amount of talent. But when you talk to him, every time he, I would pick up the phone, he'd say, how do you feel? And at first I thought, oh, he's just trying to get me to say I feel good. And that's really cheesy. And then I realized, no, wait, he actually, the words he sings are just the things he says. The guy has a second grade education. He's just singing what he says all the time. When I ask him how he's doing, he says, I feel good because that's what he says. <laughs> and <laughs> that's going to say, you know, so, <laughs> so and he, he does the ha and things like that all the time, too. It's like <laughs> he's just James Brown. <laughs> and I always say, like, he's famous in spite of himself managing himself. Like, it's it, like he had the light of God or spirit or whatever on him to really put him at the right place at the right time with the right sound at the right everything. Like, I love that. But I also loved finding new bands. One day I found this band Truck Stop Love, which was signed to the label I was at, um, sent over a tape of this local band of theirs called Vitreous Humor. I tried to get it signed to the label. The label wouldn't sign it. And so I actually brought it to other labels, Sony, Warner Brothers, because I, I knew all the A&R people and people listened to it. It was the song, Why You're So Mean to Me. And I listened to that. I'm like, that's a hit song. Somebody's got to sign this. Nobody wanted to sign them. And I knew, so my father was an entrepreneur. My mother is, is entrepreneurial. She's a therapist. She's got her own business. And I come from, of my... 13 first cousins, like 10 of them are entrepreneurs. So it was, I started my first company when I was 11. I was going to be an entrepreneur. It was, it was just in my blood. And what I wanted to do is get some understanding of the music business before I went out on my own. And, you know, as Lauren Michaels from SNL said, the show doesn't go on because you're ready. The show goes on because it's 1130. I decided I'm going to start a company and I'm going to put out this Victorious Humor album myself. And I'm going to start my own company, not because I'm ready, but because I found the band and I can't pass this up. So I put that out. Well, can I ask you, can I ask you real quick in that moment when you did that, like what was going on in your head to do it or not do it? Uh, I'm not that smart to think about that. It was like, like entering the music business. There was no choice. Like all my friends as I graduated college, they were trying to figure out what to do. And I'm like, I'm going in the music business. Like there's no other choice. With that record, like I'm not letting anybody else put this out. I'll do whatever it takes. I didn't quit my job right away, but I released the seven inch. And of course it didn't sell because who buys those things, right? But uh, the band started doing really well, you know, playing in front of a lot more people than they were before. And I was working it. I was calling radio stations. Uh, you know, I was calling magazines at the time. And, and people were getting it. And so I thought, this is good. I, I want to do something else. That's when I decided to quit my job. Now, was it smart? Meh. In hindsight, I wouldn't have changed anything at all. Wasn't at the time, I was, what, mid-20s. I think I was like 26 or something. I, I could eat ramen and hot dogs for a few months <laughs> and you know like i didn't need much so i did it 
and, and that's probably part of my problem is a lot of my decisions are are just based on gut, um, or at least uh, early on until I started learning about data. I mean, I don't really see that as being a problem. Do you have any friends who have a nine to five where they could have jumped ship at some point, but they stayed and be and they're safe and they feel, and they're they sound a little miserable for it? Not saying everyone's like that, but I know some people like that. Oh, I know. Yeah, I, I know quite a few. And listen, I say part of the problem, a little tongue in cheek, because there are some things that shouldn't be just done by gut. Listen, the it's often the smart people that get in their own way. Where perfection is the stops progress, whatever that quote is. It was something like that where it's better off not to think at that point. Like if there's something I'm really passionate about and I am not going to let anybody else hold me back from doing this. There was no choice but success. I was ready to do whatever it took to build my record label. So you just decided, fuck it, I'm going to start my label. So when you do this, did you, I mean, it sounds like because you worked for, it was EMI, right? Uh, I worked for A&M and then I was working at a company called Scotty Brothers. Okay. So A&M, Scotty Brothers. You already, you got to see what the behind the scenes looked like for all the particulars of what it needed to, what you needed to run a label. And then you know, you have all different departments taking on things, even uh, depending on how big the label is. It's like usually people are wearing many hats or they're just wearing one hat. So now you have to wear all the hats. Correct. And so what in the beginning did you have kind of like a scrap, like a piece of paper with some scratch, you know, some handwriting on it, just like, just kind of bullet pointing some ideas, or you just go, all right, I'm gonna put this band out. I know how to get the technical, I know how to get it printed, and then I know how to get distroed, and then you just went with it, or did you kind of like write down a little bit of a like a game plan before doing everything? There was no game plan. I remember driving with a friend when I came up with the name Crank. That was the game plan. <laughs> um, <laughs> start with a name. That's all you need. <laughs> start with a name. Great. I got a label. Listen, when I, I, I'm the type of person that likes to understand all aspects of creating something. And so when I was at record labels, I was involved, whether directly or indirectly, with, with everything. Production, meaning creating records, so production. And, and, and I was fortunate enough to be in the studio with you know some of the top top artists and understand how it's how it should be done to manufacturing to promotion press and so i had relationships already i knew other a r people i knew pr people i uh, i were also i've always been a writer so i was already writing for some magazines and so i knew the basics uh, as much as somebody can over i think it was three years that i had been working three four years so i didn't come up with a plan at the time i knew all right, I have this 45 and I got to get people to listen to it because I think it's awesome. I need to call up every college station I can and get them a copy. And then I need to call, find a list, however I can, of every cool print magazine out there that will review a uh, seven inch and send them a copy and then call them as much as possible and email them. And, and, and so that's what I did. And distribution i didn't have any so the band i forget what i did at first i know that's kansas and topeka and then wait uh, hold on one cool second stores. wait one second you keep for some reason this thing keeps cutting out i'm gonna turn off bluetooth and then go back on so i called record stores you know every cool indie record store i could and uh in lawrence kansas topeka kansas LA, you know, I go to them in LA, New York, whatever the hot hot markets are that I could find and try to get them to put the seven inch in. And most of it was consignment at that point. Were you like, were, was there any fear behind doing that initially in the first couple calls or you just didn't care? Well, I mean, I think this is the part where I start crying. Uh, There's, (laughs) you know, there's fear in every call. There kind of still is, but again, like I just dealt with it because I believed in what I was doing. I believe that Why You're So Mean to Me should be a hit song. It was better than every song on the radio. God damn it, I was going to make sure people heard that. I was really passionate about it. And, you know, you can't tell me no. <laughs> I love it. I think that's like the driving force, though, for a lot of people when they, they get too caught up in the technical. But at the core of it is, like you said, is I believe in this. As soon as you say that, and I and I 
it's like you make a mission statement for yourself and then everything else you kind of just wing it based on the gut instinct of being like i just i'm doing this because i believe everyone should hear this and then everything else will just fall in line yeah yeah and let's remember what the 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 music environment was back then this was 90s was a mid to to late 90s and it was all about the major labels the five or six major labels whatever it was it was all about highly produced music kenny g michael bolton were huge and there was this underground not you know this is the indie scene like the dc punk had already started making waves now it was transitioning to this melodic kind of punk post grungy sound Emo was not a name by any means. You know, when I heard Vitreous Humor, I'm like, this is a great pop song. I like pop. I want to put out this pop song. There wasn't, you know, the the normal, quote unquote, normal methods was of getting music out there was make sure that, you know, payola was still a little going on. So pay the record label, pay the radio station to play your song and make sure you're taking the record store people tower records or whatever out to dinner so you had, you had prime placement and schmooze the magazine spin and rolling stone i'm like i don't have anything to, i can't do that let me find the indie stores let me call the college stations let's get them to play it maybe if they play it then k-rock or whoever else the big stations are might hear it um and, and that was my thought and i still feel like it should have happened <laughs> <laughs> Well, on on your Discogs, it says Daisy's 7-inch is the first release. So is that just wrong on there? Because it's like Daisy's, then Boy's Life, Vitreous Humor. I skipped over a little part, which isn't, uh, I'll tell you, just because it was so small, it's not that meaningful. So when I started the the Vitreous Humor, when we put that out, I had a partner. And it was originally called Gearhead Records. So the first pressings of the Vitreous Humor album were on the Gearhead label. I realized that it was this guy, uh, Michael, who I worked with in a and And as that record got out, it became very clear that I was in this for the long haul. And he was in it because it was cool to put out a 7-inch. And so we split. He kept the name Gearhead. I kept the Vitreous Humor record and the logo. It then became Crank. And I re-released it as Crank after I sold out of Gearhead. Uh, but that was the first. Daisy's was technically the first one with a crank logo on it. And what happened is my girlfriend at the time, Cam, was very good friends with the managers of Radiohead. They had this band that they were working with called the Daisies. And so they essentially said, we need this put out in the U.S. Will you do it? We'll fund everything. You just print it and sell it. And, and I thought, I got Fitcher's Humor, which is a good pop thing. The Daisies are really catchy pop. It's got the power of the Radiohead people behind it. So yeah, I'll put it out. I got pop. And, uh, but that, I, like, great guys that came over, they toured. But it, it just, you know, I was too small, and it wasn't the right sound for a small label. Well, it's the pop thing. You said it a couple times. Was that a direction you were going in because you personally liked it? Or did you want to go after a direction that people were listening to and you wanted to tap into that? Uh, I'm going to, boy's life changed everything. We're, we'll get there in a second, okay. but it looks it too. When you look at the catalog, it's all of a sudden it just completely goes in that direction. Yes. And it was a really important move again. I'll tell you that in a second. So when I left my record label, when I left the label I was working at, when I left my paycheck, I said to myself two things for the rest of my life, I'm only going to work with people that I like and respect life's too short for me to have to work with people i don't like and so i i I vowed that to myself never hire people i don't like secondly i only want to release music i love i don't want to release music for the sake of releasing music my tastes have always been varied listen i go i i was while i was at the record label i was very much into hip-hop and i had i was being considered for the editorial role at source magazine I think it was that one. And so like, you know, I was into rap, I was into opera, I was into classical, I was into rock. I was like, every, I'd listen to everything. For me, it was just finding good music and bands that had that extra something. And I didn't really care. Like I wasn't going to sign 
country or classical. I wanted something that can at least have some mass awareness. And at the same time, I was up against all the major label record labels, all their A&R people, right? So I had, a, I had to be first. I had, a, I had to be better than faster than them. And it's really hard to be a good band and not be found. You know, I just had to find stuff. I got lucky with vitreous humor. I felt like the daisies popped into my lap. I wasn't thinking I'm a pop label by any means. I'm just thinking, okay, these are two good bands. What's next? So it sounds like Boy's Life is, like you said, is the game changer for you. So what happens there? Because I see that when you put them out, again, I'm just going on Discog, so I don't know how accurate a lot of this is, but it's like that's your fourth release, and then it's like two releases later, it's them, it's them, it's them. So it's like you that you really get behind these guys for a couple, like, oh, just for a, a bunch of releases. So what happens with you connecting with them? Hold on, because I'm going to, oh, the Boy's Life Vitreous. Vit- are you looking at? The crank site? Yeah, actually, here, I'll send you a link of where I'm looking at on the Skype chat. Uh, let's see, here we go. Okay, yeah, so there's a link in the chat. If you just scroll down, there should be a little chat button. Okay, and here's where I am. Okay, so you're on your own website. So that's obviously going to be a lot more uh, accurate. Okay, okay. One day, I think it was Brad Allen um, from Vitreous Humor called me and he's like, you got to hear this band, Boy's Life. He sent me a tape that I think was from a live show. I listened to it. I'm like, eh, it's okay. He's like, no, trust me. You need, you need this band. In the meantime, so we decided to put out that split, the, the seven inch of Boy's Life, Vicious Humor. And actually, that's the one that had Wire So Mean to Me. I'm sorry. I, my memory is, this was a long time ago. Oh, yeah. Don't, um, don't worry. We'll just make things up. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We made the Vitreous Humor EP as I decided, I was starting to get Boy's Life and decided to sign them because it seemed pretty good and I really trusted the Vitreous Humor guys' opinions on this. Um, I also went to see Boy's Life live and I thought they put on a hell of a show. So sign them up. When we made the record, we did the record down in San Diego. And I was blown away. Like, I thought, this is the next nevermind. Like, what these guys are doing is insanely good. And I don't know if anybody's going to get this, because it took me a while. But I was like, this is one of the best records I've ever heard in my life. And all of a sudden, I was like, all right, I got Vitreous Humor, this pop band. And then I got Boy's Life, which is... It's closer to DC punk than it is to vicious humor. I, I loved it. Like, I didn't know where it went. What then that led to is they introduced me to Christy Front Drive, which, you know, beautifully melodic sounds. We did, we did the split 10. And then all of a sudden I get uh, something in the mail from this, you know, a band called Mineral. It was just in my, you know, I would get so many demos, seven inches and in tapes, and it was just in a pile. You know, another one of, hey, we love Boy's Life. We love Vitreous Humor. We're friends with Christy Front Drive. Um, we'd love for you to hear our, our music. You want me to get into Mineral now? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I remember it very, very clearly. I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a runner. I just come back from a run. Whenever I had free moments, I'd throw on demos nonstop and give it eight bars if it was terrible throw it away if it's good keep listening and blah blah blah. and so they sent me the seven inch i was about to take a shower i put it on i jumped i turned it on loud so i jumped in the shower and it was the opening of um it was opening a parking lot jesus okay yeah yeah so the first thing i hear i hear this like i'm like i didn't turn it up loud enough and then all of a sudden scott's screeching guitar yeah and and i I actually pulled my head out of the shower and I'm like, what the fuck? And so I got out of the shower. I'm still wet, right? I wrap my towel around me. I go back out to my record player and I start it over again. And I sit there on my couch, wet, listening to the song. And I'm like, I was just, I'd like my world changed at that moment. I sent a note immediately. I think it was to Chris. Like, I, I, I'm blown away. I think I said... I may have said immediately, like, I got to put this out. 
and I stalked him for like 24 hours because <laughs> this was, you know it, like it was incredible. Fuck yeah, it is. So <laughs> yeah. goddamn good. Yeah. And it was, and I finally, like I flew down, I met the guys, we, we got along great and we decided to, to do a record and, and put it out. And we made the power of failing. And I remember before it came out, I was at my home, I was listening to it for the 40 billionth time and thinking, I know a secret that nobody else knows yet. And they're about to find out, find out and it's going to change everything. I was just like, I thought the Boy's Life album was good. This was, this album spoke to my soul. Then I put it out. I had gotten a little bit of distribution, but I was still, you know, I, I was still hustling, like sending it to radio stations, calling up, sending it to, I was a press guy, the radio guy, the manufacturing guy, the retail guy. I was just nonstop email phones. You got to hear this stuff. And then, you know, people started listening reviews started coming in really quickly. And it was the first time I heard the word emo. Um, I forget if it was Spin Magazine or somebody early on, uh, a review was, I have heard emo and thy name is Mineral. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> and listen, I was a Sunday Day Real Estate fan. Hell yeah, too. same. I thought, okay, this is like a really good version of Sunday Day Real Estate. Let me ask you this. So when you're sending this, out, okay, so there's a bunch of shit. I want to sit on this for a second. Because um, I was going to say, when you heard this and you'd said it, you're like, I know a secret because you're, you're like, I know this is huge. So I'm imagining because you're, you're like, I'm stalking Chris and you sent him a note. When you sent him a note, was it an email? Uh, it probably was an email and then a phone call. I mean, email was, I had my AOL address at that time. It wasn't big at that time at all. No, not at all. Because I was like, how did you, I was like, what are you sending him like a snail mail? I'm like, how you didn't get in front of him? Yeah, no, no. I either emailed him. I'm not sure if he had an email address on there, but I definitely like, definitely called him nonstop. Did you feel almost like, um, did you feel an urgency when you heard it? Like, I have to sign them now or I'm fucking going to miss out. Without question. Like the, within the first eight bars. You know, once that guitar kicks in a parking lot, I'm like, I need that. Like, I need that. I cannot live my life without working with that band. So it's funny that you said that because I interviewed Chris and we're talking about, and Scott's the guitar player, right? Yeah. So I'm talking, I'm like, did you, I asked him some question about Scott and he, he just, he has that, just that roaring guitar shit that he does. And uh, he's like, yeah, someone came up to me and was like, yo, man, you, you got to tell Scott to, to tone it down. And Chris goes, no, man, I think I'm just going to let his let him do his thing because he's on to something. So it's funny that he he recognized that. And then that when you're t telling the story and you hear that, that that just that bend, that's the thing that, you know, one of the things. But like you said, the thing where you're like, wait, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, <laughs> amazing. And it was like for the first song that they put out to come up with that is, I mean, that's like Beastie Boys first album level. Like really you came up with that when you're 19 years old, <laughs> but, but listen, I, you know, we'll, we'll come back. But as a quick fast forward, when I, there was this one gig they did in Austin and there were a lot of record labels down to some major labels down to see them. And the president of Interscope was down there. And I always thought, Chris, like Chris is the star. He is insanely talented. And the guys, like they all worked well, it's like so well together, but I felt like it all re revolved around Chris. And then after that show, I was talking to, uh, to Tom Wally, the, the head of Interscope. And, and I said, what do you think of the show? And he's like, that guitarist is amazing. Like he is, in, you can't take your eyes off him. And I was like, you mean, the one who stands with his back to the audience, <laughs> Scott, he's like, yeah. And, and then I, you know, I, I realized too, how like perfect Scott fit in with that group. Oh yeah. And I think Scott's really good. I think that Scott, Jeremy and Chris and Gabe, yes, the drummer, but really Scott, Jeremy and Chris were such a strong trio together that uh, it created something really, really special.
and then with Gabe's backbeat. <laughs> you know, it, when Scott and Tune, and you watch him play in old videos, there's a video of them playing, I think it was Michigan Fest or something. It's also the same festival where Jimmy at World's playing, and they have that one song on their seven inch. This, uh, what would I say to you now? Like, there's a video of them playing that, and they're all in the same thing. But you watch the mineral video, it's just like, you're like, oh my God. But when Scott's playing, he just has this like face on that it's, it's, he's just lost in it almost. It's like he's lost in it and just doesn't give a fuck. And just, it, it just like, but I could see where that guy saw that because when I watch it, I'm like, they all, like, I definitely, Chris has the presence, man. But then Scott has his own little ball where he's like, I'm doing my thing, man. Just let me do it. And you're like, holy shit, that's so cool. Yeah. And when he, he goes, I don't know if anybody else notices this, but he goes on his, t- on his tippy toes and he's playing and you just feel like he's going to fall over. You know, he's like wobbling there. And I always picture it when he's doing that that riff in the parking lot, and he's just like reaching into his soul, and and it's lifting him off the ground yeah. as he's playing that, and you just feel like oh, he's gonna just like fall to the ground and stuff, <laughs> but somehow he keeps going. <laughs> so I don't want to I don't want to stay on mineral the whole time because you have so many bands, but I do want to point out when you're sending this, and this could also have replicated in other releases you're sending when you're sending power failing to record stations to be like, hey, give this a spin. Are you saying to them, start with this one song where I'm thinking, I'm almost thinking like Parking Lot's fucking solid and that whole album's solid, but Slower's the the hit on that too. So were you sending that to a label with a note, start with this song first? I'm not sure. So people really like Gloria. So the, the, the seven inch was Gloria Parking Lot. I don't think I did because I didn't think that there was a bad track on it with the possible exception of 8037. What? Uh, yeah, I know. I'm the only Get one. Get the fuck out of here. That song is so great. <laughs> it is great. Oh Keep God. in mind, I think Take the Picture Now is one of the best songs uh, ever. And nobody <laughs> nobody but me thinks that. Yeah, I don't agree with that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, like, I, I understand my, my thoughts may not be right on. However... Um, I think I just sent it out. I may have I may have pointed people to parking lot. I probably did because I, I feel like that song is a level above everything else in music. But I, I honestly don't remember. And this is only let's see, this is six releases in. This is all within how many years have you started the label? Two, three. So when this happens, did you see some kind of like hockey stick happen with the label where you're like oh shit, now we're getting some, people are paying attention to us. Yeah, but keep in mind, like, I I wasn't thinking, um, you know, I was thinking grow, I was definitely thinking grow the label, but I was really about the bands. I was super excited that all, people were latching on to Mineral, and then that was getting them to listen to some of the other stuff. So they were starting to hear Oh, like there's other good things on this on this label too, and so Vicious Humor and Boys Life were starting to get more listens. This was the time where one day I opened the mail and there's a letter from uh, I think it was like Goleta, California. I open it up and it's there's a twenty dollar bill inside and and a and a kid like, hey, can you send me? I think it was the Boys Life album. Can you send me the Boys Life CD? Here's twenty bucks. I hope it's enough. I looked at that. That was another turning point. I was like, really? People are going to mail me money to send them music? He could just go to a store and get it. And so I'm like, great, I'm going to do a mail order catalog. And so I immediately printed out our five releases at the time. I sent Boys Life CD. I sent him 10 bucks back. I'm like, it's only $10. Here's another 10 But here's a bunch of mail order catalogs. Send them to your friends. If they want to buy anything, have them send money in. That ended up growing into a company called Saul Goodman and having thousands of items in the catalog, it, w- it really, uh, that kind of changed the trajectory of the, of the organization as well. Cause all of a sudden I now built a mail order catalog. Okay. I just have to stop there. The, the Saul Goodman thing. Cause I watch better call Saul and breaking bad. Is that like a popular saying? Like how the, f- no, I don't know where I got it from. I don't know where I got it. From. Okay, I just like it was one of those where I had to point that out because it's so relevant right now with Better Call Saul and all that being such a huge thing. I'm like, this. How could I not 
stop here for a second and be like, how did you come up with this fucking name? Yeah. So I mean, I like I, I've done interviews where people are like the, you, the, you're the original Saul Goodman. Uh, and I still have I was using some matches to light a uh, birthday candle for my daughter this morning from Saul Goodman candles, uh, matches. Um, but no, it was just it was I just ran it was just a bad business name. <laughs> I so <laughs> I remember I remember that back in the day where you know because I'm 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 like seventeen and ninety six and when we're getting releases they're coming with these catalogs and it was like send well hidden cash to this thing I never I don't think I ever did that I would just buy at the record stores but when that came in how did you organize that I know this is like a technical question but I'm just so I'm fascinated by how did you keep that organized where you didn't fuck that up. In terms of like you get it, it, you get like all these letters. Say you get like twenty letters in the mail, and each of them have cash with like a list. Like how do you how do you organize that to know you're sending the stuff back to the right person? Oh, I I just I would take the the cash or check or whatever it is in the order, and it eventually became order forms. I just put it in a pile, and so when I went to mail stuff out i see okay they count all these up i need five boys life four mineral blah blah blah. i got the envelopes i stuff them in and then i you know i'd send a note i'd throw some stickers in there and send it off so it was just like i do mail order every two or three days and uh it was manageable until i had to hire somebody to do it oh that was my next question like at what point do you how many people did you actually have working for you at the peak of this thing I wish I remembered that. It was like eight, I think, seven or eight. Okay, that's, that's yeah. significant. Yeah, that's really significant. Uh, so at what? So ra- at this point now, with like mineral coming out, and then you're moving on to you know all the other releases after this. Did you get an office? Were you working out of your house? Like when you start getting people, like how does this start to grow around you at this point? Yeah. So w- one of the big things, so the mineral album came out and started doing well and we started getting courted by record labels. Keep in mind, I knew the A&R people, so I was making sure they understood everything I was doing along the way. I really built up excitement around Mineral. I knew there was something exciting there and so I made I, I built it up with the A&R community. Then I contacted a writer at the LA Times and I gave a pitch of a Dave, the David and Goliath story, right? Which at the time was really, there weren't a lot of indie labels out there. And so I was like, we are taking on the majors. We are going to be better than them. And lo and behold, they liked the pitch and they put me on the cover. And so all of a sudden I got a band doing well. Radio stations are really, college radio is really liking them. Press, including, I don't think we got Rolling Stone, but Spin and AP and those magazines were starting to write about them. Now I'm, I'm on the cover of the business section of the LA Times. And, you know, then there were a bunch of interviews and, and the mags and stuff. So, so we got attention. We got a lot of industry attention. And that's when things started elevating. Now, listen, we got a lot of industry attention for Boy's Life when the boy, oh, I'm sorry, for Vitreous when the Why Are You So Mean to Me came out. A year and a half earlier, nobody cared about that song. But when I released the split with Why You're So Mean to Me, all of a sudden, I'm being flown around the country and Vitreous Humor is being courted by major labels to sign them. They were at a point where like, keep in mind, this was like seven months into starting Crank. And and they, they were like, screw that. You didn't want us a year ago. Why now? We're staying with Crank. And I was like, screw that. You didn't want me a year ago. <laughs> I'm staying with this. And then when Mineral came out, they came back and were like, holy shit, what's this label doing? And so I, I, had, I built a, you know, a good name out there and, and Mineral was the real deal. So things industry-wise started taking off pretty big. I mean, very big. So it looks like as soon as that comes out, then the next two, the next three releases are seven inches. No, four releases are seven inches. And then you go back. Then it's like, like five or like seven inches, 10 inches. Why did you go in that direction instead of doing a full LP with a band? Or did that all happen within the same year where it didn't really matter? Yeah, it happened quickly. So what I would do is if I found some good songs with a band and I thought that they had maybe more, I'd put out a 7-inch first. And then if it developed into something and got good feedback, I'd move it to a something more. Interesting. Because it's cheaper, obviously, to do a 7-inch than a CD at that point. Yeah, and sometimes... 
like the Don't Forget to Breathe soundtrack. Is that sometimes I find a band that just has one really good song. Listen, my, my A&R theory, and in fact, this, this uh, works in life in general, is if a band has one great song, it's luck. If they have two great songs, it's coincidence. And if they have three great songs, it's talent. So when I find a band that just has one great song, I think, well, I love that. I love to put that out, but I, I don't want to, I don't think you got anything else that I, that's really going to mean as much to me. And that's what a lot of don't forget to breathe was, is all these great songs that I found that I wanted to put out. And, and so I decided to just put them all together and then add, you know, some of the bands with them. Interesting. Yeah. I'm thinking of like bands like Harvey Danger with that one great song and then everything else you listen to the cd you're just like nah and there was a lot of that back then and i think it's why a lot of people congregate to spotify and stuff because we all know that some bands just have a song that you want and the rest of it doesn't really work for you yeah yeah and i don't know if you've listened to uh far apart seven inch the song hazel which it is one of the favorite songs i've ever put out they had only recorded those those two songs um, on that seven inch, and I kept asking, "Give me, a, give me an album, give me an album, let me hear something." And they finally put something together like three years later, and and honestly, I was disappointed with it. But that song is just insanely good. Yeah, if you're on Spotify, I just went there right now. Two hundred forty five thousand downloads, and the one below it's got eighteen thousand, which is nothing to really shake a stick at. But that's you that it can tell you right there where people are going after. Like we love that one song the most. Yeah. Like if a band came to you and said, hey, we want to be on Crank, because I'm sure at this point more bands are coming to you because they're seeing like, oh, wow, this label is known and you guys are putting out good re- good records. When they'd come to you and say, we want to be on the label, it sounds like, would you be direct with them if you with your thoughts? Yeah, well, again, let's go back to the time. This was pre-YouTube or Spotify or SoundCloud or any of that. So it was a lot of seven inches and actual tapes being sent in, um, some CDs as well more and more cds i recognized that as i said before if there was a really good band it's really really hard for them to stay unnoticed and so whether it's a manager a lawyer you know another a and r person they're going to be found so i was friends with a lot of attorneys a lot of managers i found you know i would get a lot of bands that way if i didn't like it i'd tell them not my thing the ones that would just came in unsolicited I mean, Mineral was the really odd standout. You really don't get those in an unsolicited. And most of them are just not good. And there's too many to actually respond. I used to respond to them, but, you know, I'm listening to 80 different bands a day. Uh, so I would just pass on it. If somebody asked me, I'd be, I'd be, yeah, I'd tell them, here's my recommendation of what you should do. And, you know, I said a lot of, at the time, U2 was all over pop radio. And so I like, listen to to radio now. It's U2. It's whoever was there. Like, do you think your song is better than U2? Because that's who you're competing with. And that's who I'm competing with when I got to even tell a college radio station to do it. And so I don't think you're there yet. So I know that bands in general are pretty sensitive, <laughs> pretty much. Yes. Because yeah. they're artists, they're creating stuff, they get very sensitive. It's like their their baby is their song. By you doing that to bands, and it, like certain labels had certain personalities that were shared throughout the scene, where it was like Fat Records, like, oh, wow, like No Effects, a fat mic, and he doesn't give a fuck, and you know, it's super fast, and like, we know we, that's what we see them as. Or if it's like Victory Records, it's like, we hear that guy's an asshole, and he's fucking his bands over. You know, yeah. this is like the word on the street. With Crank, what was the, the dialogue around you? especially since you were being honest with certain bands? You could probably tell me that better than I can. Uh, And I I love to hear it. My gut is that there's, I felt like a, an ATM machine for a lot of the bands. And so I felt like I could be used that way. I also not the coolest guy in the world, at least for them at the time. I'm not sure, you know, there was a falling out with Boy's Life, so fairly positive. They weren't saying anything nice about me, about me. but I don't know. What, do you, what did you hear? I honestly never heard anything. I just remember thinking you were such a mystery label. Um, mm. I thought you guys just lived in your own space, didn't give a fuck, put out the music you love. This is like what I remember as being like 18, yeah. and, I, and I loved it. I was like, oh, they're so cool. 
I felt labels in general you couldn't really reach. They would just live in their own space. I felt Asian man always sounded like this fun thing because Mike Park is just fun and he's still like that. You know, so you, you heard about that or like, again, Victory, you just heard negative things about drive through. It's it did its drive through thing. But yeah, with yeah. you, I felt you were kind of like I almost thought of it as the guy in the record store who you wanted to impress, who was not really impressed by something, but you still felt he was cool. Like, that's how I think I saw Crank Records. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely taking it from a different angle than I was all of, what, 26, 27, but I was still older than a lot of the other indie labels at the time. That's like ancient when you're a 17 year old in a band, like someone in their late 20s are like, this is an elder. Yeah, exactly. Not a negative way, not a negative way. Yeah, no, I get that. I get that. And, And that was my role as the record label owner, right? But I also knew that I wanted to grow a company and I knew that the way to do it was to leverage all my contacts and knowledge of the greater record industry. I was working that. And I wasn't saying, hey, give us an offer and we'll take anything because we already turned down a lot of offers, right? But I was like, I'm putting, I'm going to put out the best bands there are and I'm going to make sure that I tap into the, the greater record industry to help us grow with this. And so that was the game I was playing. You know, I had a lot of good friends. I still have a lot of good friends in the record industry and, and it helped, it definitely helped without question. Was there a bit of a learning or I don't know how to say this because you go from Power of Failing, which comes out, which is a monster in, in, in like an indie term or whatever. I don't even know how many units it sells or whatever, but everyone that I know to this day, like people who love metal, they're like, I fucking still love this band. Then within a year or whatever it was, they break up. So as a label, did you have this moment where you're like, we got this record. It's in our eyes, a monster. Um, it's, it's, people recognizing it it's doing well for us and then a year or so later they break up was there kind of like a okay never get comfortable this is definitely where i cry so the uh <laughs> the, here there's um a couple things that that are the background to this so first of all one of the reasons i started crank is because i saw what brett gurowitz did with with epitaph and how he proved when offspring went massive that an indie label could do it and kind of screw the majors. And so as Crank was, as Mineral was starting to, to get some attention, I, I was, I think I was back East and visiting uh, my family. I come back home, you know, I had a voicemail, the message machine there. I click the message and I hear, Hey, Jeff, my name is Brett Gurowitz. I own a label called Epitaph. Uh, I've heard a lot of great things about you. I'd love to meet you. <laughs> Shit. And I wish I kept that. Because oh I, I was like, I practically peed my pants. You know, here's the guy that it w- was one of the reasons that I started a label. Though he doesn't know it, I never met the guy at all. And uh, funny story, as I was, you know, my plans to meet him, whatever it was, two weeks away, I had another flight. I was coming back from uh, wherever I was the day before the meeting, and I had to make, I wanted to make notes of all the questions that I wanted to ask him. And the only thing I had on the plane to write on was a barf bag. And so I took it out and I started just like jotting. The whole thing was filled with, you know, my little s- s- scribbling of all the questions I have. And so I'm in the meeting with him the next day and I'm talking, and he's like, you know, what else? I'm like, listen, if you don't mind, I wrote some notes and I, I pull out the barf bag <laughs> and, he's, and he starts laughing and he just kept referring to what else do you have on your barf bag? <laughs> Wait, what did you tell him? Uh, I'm like, listen, I, I, what do I tell him about that comment? No, like, what did comment? you, what did you write on the, like, when you meet with him and you write all these notes, like, what were you telling him from this? Oh, notes? I was like, like, basically, how did you do it? Like, what, how, what did you do to make Offspring so big and to build this label? Like, what's the secret? What do I need to know? As it turned out, you know, we've been courted with, you know, by the president of every label. The CEO of every label was, was after Mineral and Crank. And Mineral ended up doing a deal with, uh, with Interscope. Um, I'm going to get get to the breakup in a second. So they signed the deal with Interscope. They uh, they got whatever they got paid for that. I did 
one deal with Interscope, but then I did a distribution deal with Epitaph. And so, because it was really important to me to maintain cred, all, especially with bands like Boys Life and, and Mineral. That's where I was going as I really started realizing there's this scene like, you know, this is this Jimmy Eat World band seems really cool. And, you know, all these others coming out are like, holy crap, I like this scene. It means something to me. I ended up getting to work with, with Brett quite closely. So the deal I did with Interscope was Mineral assigned to Interscope, but I would get to put out their second record. Then they would move for their third and on. And deals were signed. Again, I remember exactly where I was when I get that call from, I think it may have been Chris and Jeremy saying, it was an all for one, one for all. And they're like, Gabe is quitting the band or something like that. So we're breaking up. And I just felt my life fall away. And I, I didn't know what to say. I tried to convince them. I said, I come down and, and try. I'm like, you could find a different drummer. They're like, no, it's all of us or none. And, uh, and so that was really, really disappointing, both as a label, but also as a fan. Like I really felt their lives, those guys were going to have their lives changed in very meaningful ways for them, whether they became a hit band or not. And I think they had a chance of being, you know, I'm not saying they sound like the Smashing Pumpkins, but the Smashing Pumpkins at the time fit this like cool rock, not pop and not quite punk, but you know, the separate little corner that I felt Mineral could own, like credibility, authenticity, and chops like nobody believes. You know, it, it's funny when I, I've talked to a bunch of labels and they'll talk about bands like that where they're saying this band is going to be this next big thing. I've never saw, like I, every time they talk about a band and I remember them through, even now I see them in videos playing live or whatever it is. I never felt that any of the bands that I've been told could be huge would actually fit the bill like a Smashing Pumpkins or Nirvana or U2 where they'd be able to to control a, an arena crowd. It's like I felt a lot of the bands they say that about just really were on stage for them. They didn't really work a crowd and I felt like they it wouldn't really work in their favor if they got to be that big. Yeah, and I felt like at the time, at least, you know, Chris and they all were very grounded. They were pizza delivery guys before, yeah. and yeah. they just loved creating music, and they did it really well together. They vibed. I hope that they could have kept that. You know, I, I think one of the probably most impactful memories I have was was their last show that I saw them, which is South by Southwest. And I forget what the venue was, but it was big. I mean, big meaning over a thousand people and it was packed. They came out, they're on stage with a crap load of people in the audience and they're starting maybe parking lot. I forget what they started with and all their backs were to the crowd. And then as soon as it kicked in, Jeremy bass player turns around and looks at the crowd and I can see his, his face mouthing the words, wow. And it's the first time when I saw them on stage, I'm like, yeah, they could play in front of 5,000, 10,000. Maybe they're not there yet, but they could get there and hold their own. Now, do I think they'd be the Rolling Stones? No, I don't think Chris's voice is that crossovery, but I think that they could have had a very, very nice life. How does this change your signing style moving forward did you feel more guarded or what happened no it didn't change like i think one of the challenges i had is i felt too empowered right because vitreous humor boys uh, you know boys life was was uh the, the magazines loved it fans loved it the emo fans kind of crossover punk fans um so it had credibility and then mineral like i kept each release was growing bigger and bigger. And I thought, yeah, I got a good ear. So I, I think I put out some stuff that I don't think it, it didn't take the label to the next level. The stuff afterwards. Yeah. Some of the stuff afterwards. Right. Um, some of it, listen, I had a relationship with Interscope and they wanted to see me putting out music 
I remember Tom saying to me, Tom Wally, you know, this, the head of Interscope, saying, uh, "Listen, your your job is to keep finding music, so keep finding it and keep putting it out." And so there was, I felt a little pressure of, all right, I got to at least put out some seven inches. So I was putting stuff out until I could find the next mineral, essentially. You know, there's some fantastic stuff there, but none of it hit as great. I mean, I I really wanted to work with Jimmy Eat World. Got an opportunity to work with him. Really wanted to work with Bright Eyes. Got an opportunity to work with him. I loved the band Fireside. They won a Grammy for their the album, the first album I put out. They got a Swedish Grammy for it, oh, and shit. nobody cared about it in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, that was I, I. I loved him, but it was hard. But I still was working forward, and the, every release, most of the releases I put out, you know, the fan base, the crank fan base, just kept growing and growing. And mineral was, I don't want to say it was the entry drug because it was more than an entry drug. That was like, that was the heroin. But once you're in the mineral and you start expanding out and finding some of these other bands, it, it just started helping, you know, helping all the bands. Well, I mean, I got to point out too, is that, and I want to jump forward to more bands and stuff. Um, that Jimmy Eat World, it's Christmas card is the song they put on that split, right? Yeah. That's like one of my favorite songs. I remember it was the summer of 98 and... What was Crush? Crush. They put on it. Was it Crush? Yeah. What did they do Christmas card with? Who was that split with? Don't. Was it... Um, what's his name out of Nebraska? Oh, it was Crush. Um, fuck, wait. Hold on. What was the Crush? Because I remember it was like... Din, 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 hey, hey. That's Christmas card, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I just... Because I... But... Either way, though, I think Crush 2, it was like that summer, my buddy had a stack of 7-inch. This is when I'm starting to really get into emo and, and punk and stuff. But I remember listening to that split with Mineral and Sensefield and Jimmy World. And hearing that song on it, I, I would just like would play it. I would stop it and play it again and then play it again and play it again. That was like the main song on that, on that fucking thing that I would listen to. I just I know I just to point that out because that was such again there's like just these things where I'm like oh wait well, hold on, let me listen to Crush one second oh Fade of Snow Keep Falling yeah dude that song and then they put it on Clarity oh my god yes it's so great it's such a fucking awesome song you know it was, you may remember this at the time and and listen I I would I hung out in my fair share of basements but I wasn't deep into the scene right like I would spend my nights in clubs looking for bands I was not the emo guy I'm not a straight edge guy. Jimmy Eat World, I thought was awesome. I, I'd seen them in a couple of basements and I thought they were great. My feeling is that people in the scene, other bands in the scene were like, yeah, Jimmy Eat World's good, but they're just, they just want to be on a major label. So they didn't have as much cred. Listen, my, I, they were always nice to me, seemed like nice guys. Sensefield, I don't remember how that happened, but I think they were on Warner Brothers. And I think one of my friends from Warner Brothers was like, will you put out a seven inch? I forget how it happened. I didn't want to do just a sense field something. So I think that's how I got Mineral and Jimmy World involved. It's such a great seven inch though. It's so It is an great. awesome seven inch. And listen, uh, the version of Crazy that Mineral did, like I was sitting in the room when you know, Chris turns on the little tape recorder and clicks record and Start strumming. <laughs> it's classic. Oh wait, so you saw him record that live? Yeah, oh, yeah it was in Austin. It was in the, like his bedroom or something. That's so nuts. Oh my god. That's what I love about these stories. It's like this shit was put in front of me, and someone just had a seven inch, and then my mind just starts going, "How is this created?" And then you're like, "Yeah, I was in the room where he just hit record and, and he plays it." And you're like, "Oh my god, <laughs> that's so fucking nuts." Yeah. So when they signed with Interscope and you can correct me, talk to Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think they got some recording equipment and some sort of board that they could record from. And so what I remember is he had his recording board and the tape and he just laid down a few tracks, did a couple takes, and I walked away with side A. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's fucking amazing yeah he was telling me about to, I, I feel like i'm making this very into a very mineral thing which i'm really not trying to do but they're just so top of mind because like i love gloria record and then and serenading comes out and i talked to chris about that i was like you know it doesn't it sounds so different from power of failing he goes because then he's saying i used to write 
the lyrics, I believe, as he was writing the music. And Serenading was written as all music first, and then he was driving back from somewhere for a couple days and wrote the, the lyrics in his head. So I could, I was like, that's why it sounds so different. I mean, A, it's so much slower than Power of Failing. And it's like, I remember putting it on and I was like, when is this going to kick in? Yep. And the record ends. And I was like, what the fuck happened? Yeah, it's a really different record. And, and, and listen, when they recorded it, they'd already broken up. And so it wasn't like the happy go lucky of it all. Uh, and yeah, I think it's good. I don't think it's a power of failing. I think power of failing, they may be re recording it. I hope they, I don't know. If, I hope they at least remix it. But yeah, and Serenading is a, is a great record, just a different vibe. So the label is around. So this point, this is like 98, 99, right? Where all this is happening, we're talking about? Yeah. So I, um, everything happened really quickly. I think I started the label in 94. We did the deal with Interscope in 97, maybe I started. Yeah, 94 to 97. I, everything probably was done around 99, 98, 99. So I'm um, going to, sorry, go, sorry, go on. There was more. I was going to, I just want to bring up Bright Eyes at some point, but you ask your question. No, I mean, that's, I really want to fill in because it's like the, the label ends in 2005, so I really want to work up to that because I bring this up with every label, every band, when Napster comes out, how it changes the industry, how it, some labels look at it. But we're still in like 90, 99. And I'm looking through all the releases you do and trying to think of like, what's the next one that comes out where it gives you another boost of, okay, th- this one, this is our next mineral, this is our next power failing or something like that, where it's like, this is our next boost that the, that the label needed to just keep me in it. Or did you not need that to keep the label going for, you know, eight more years or or five more years, however long it was? No, I did. I mean, listen, the, the, I won't get into the uh, finances, finances of it, but running a record label, especially back then was really expensive. There was a lot to do. There wasn't the access people have right now and so i had to hire people to get it all done i mean people there was no spotify as i said like they wanted they couldn't find in the record store i had to go buy envelopes and send it that takes man hours and and so it was really expensive to keep it and vitreous humor and boy's life love those love the records i lost a lot of money on them i don't regret putting them out by any means any of them but it's not like they paid for themselves. At the same time, though, I was, you know, as I said early on, I was really hustling. In fact, throughout the whole thing, I was hustling. And so I created essentially an ambassador program, a street team, to promote crank bands around the country. And it turns out they did a good job. And then it turns out my friends at Warner Brothers and EMI and Capital and Sony started hiring me to do that. And then that became... Saul Goodman. That became a completely separate company. And that was what again? That was a distro company? It was both. It was really a marketing company, but then we had a distro side. We had a mail order side of it. So Jeremy Gomez from uh, Mineral actually built our first website. We were growing mail order like hotcakes early on. It was crazy. I should have kept that website because then I had somebody else rebuild it and it wasn't as good as what Jeremy did. So then that turned into a marketing company. And honestly, I turned that, eventually turned that into a marketing agency that developed go-to-market strategies for Fortune 1000. So we ended up working with Kellogg and Citibank and Kraft and Nike and a bunch of others. Okay, so now I can see I'm connecting the dots here between that and where you are now. So like you've had all this experience in businesses. I was like, where does this start where you start knowing how to look from the outside and say, all right, just tweak this, like tweak culture, tweak this, tweak that, and it's going to do things. But at this point, you're balancing that with the record label and learning that just without knowing it. Yeah, and keep in mind that Saul Goodman then had 30 employees. You know, I raised a bunch of money. It was It was going very well. So a lot of the Fred Emery, I can't not, I can't talk about Crank and not mention Frederick Emery, who is like a critical part, a key part of the entire label. Nobody is as passionate about the music as, as Fred was and is. He really took on the day-to-day while I was also running the other company. Icarus Line, he's the one that brought in Icarus Line and Neva DeNova. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, and that, that's how those came about. Was Icarus Line, when that came in, was, I know that uh, Buddy had, I, th- I believe they had a connection with them. 
Do you remember Buddyhead? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So was that like was Buddyhead happening on the same time when you guys brought on Icarus Line? Yeah, so Icarus Line is all kind of weird for me. It was like it, I'm not sure. They were a weird band, happened. right? Weren't they like a pretty crazy band? Yeah, they were a pretty crazy band. <laughs> That's what I thought. And so th- the album was already done, and and I think I don't remember the dude from Buddyhead. What's his name? Travis Kelly. Do you remember? Travis, yeah. Yeah, and then Joe. I think Joe or something was the Joe. singer of yeah. Icarus Line. And the who was the guitarist? Do you remember? Oh, he was the. I, I think he was Travis's partner in Buddyhead, right? Well, I know that his partner Buddy had went and played guitar, or he played with like Nine Inch Nails for a while. Yeah. So what happened is, I got along. I think I got along with Travis fairly well. I forget how. Like Fred came to me one day and it's like, "Hey, Chris Line, they're awesome. The album's done. They just need somebody to put it out." I listened to it. Uh, it was actually the first band that I was like, "I don't love it, but I'm gonna trust Fred." Like on this, it's not like I didn't love it. This is bad. I think it was more like. I don't get it, but that's okay because other people will probably get it. They seem like really credible and really good musicians. And we put it out and then like, I forget how long later I get a call and they're like, we're not going to have it on crank anymore. And anyway, I didn't know what happened, but next thing I hear, the guitarist is playing for Trent Reznor. <laughs> I'm like, okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> It was it was like a whirlwind thing with Icarus Line. How do they just say to you, "We're not going to be on your label"? You're like, "Didn't you guys sign a contract?" Yes, um, that gets a, a little more complicated because we're like, "All right, I I invested money. I just want my I want my money back." And at that one, because we didn't have to, we didn't, I didn't pay for the recording of the album. I just paid for manufacturing. It was a bit easier, and I forget what the the deal was, but it, it, it was fairly clean. Well, it's funny when you said that you were kind of like, I don't get it, but I think there's something here. I was thinking the same thing, and this is a super side note, but I was looking through the list in the uh, Don't Forget to Breathe um, comp, and you got Drive Like Jehu in there. That was a band where everyone loved them, and I've listened to that record so many times, I'm like, I cannot get into this fucking record. I agree. Everybody loved them, and and Mark Trombino recorded... Everything. Did boy, everything. Yeah, yeah, like uh, half my catalog. And so I thought, well, let's see if we could get something. And I told them, anything you have that has not been released, I'll take. Yeah, they delivered the bullet train to Vegas, which I actually think is a great title for a song. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted, I just wanted them on that. Again, people liked it. Like I don't fucking band. get, I don't fucking get it at all. Like I could say that without like having you say it, but it's just, I'm just like, I just could not understand. I mean, I think San Diego bands just hit differently in general. Yeah, though I love Rocket from the Crypt, I think is. Yeah. Like, they'll have that. That It's weird. They have Some bands have this edgy sound, and I've lived in San Diego. I'm like, where do you get this from? You're living in, like, the greatest temperature. You're two seconds from the beach if you're in downtown. I'm like, where do you guys get this angst from? It's fucking San Diego. It's beautiful Yeah, here. I know, right? Like, you're living in heaven. Yeah. I mean, I get the L.A. thing, because L.A., I lived there, and I wasn't a huge fan. I was in the Valley. But <laughs> it's like you're on the. Beach. I agree. I agree. I agree. Why is everybody so angry? Yeah, I was like, what the <laughs> fuck, man. Um, yeah. So like internally in the label, as you're hitting that hump and going in the 2000s, and like this, the sound starts to change and the scene starts to change. Even though you said you weren't like really paying attention to the scene, like you had some kind of lens of what was happening around as far as business and financial goes with the music industry. Like what starts happening to the label when that hump? When, once you go over the 2000s into the early 2000s? You know, there's a lot of this was my mental game with it. Listen, I, I, I am, my primary motivation is not money. I like money, but I don't get up, you know, I get up and my motivation is passion. And that's what I did. That's what led me through the record label, as we talked about earlier. There were points where it got frustrating where I was, I felt like I was negotiating with, you know, like 18 year olds who felt like they were rock stars. Intellectually, it was really challenging. You know, I'm like, you don't, you just have a demo. You don't, and I'm not talking about any band in particular here, but you know, there's one that I didn't sign that I remember in particular that um, like, you got a demo, you only play to like 200 people in your local market. I, I, what are you talking about? I don't, 
I'm not going to negotiate like this. Then there were some other labels that um, had really latched on to the emo scene and were doing really, really well. And there was a lot more competition. And I, I just, I, I was now running two companies and I wasn't in the game as much. So I think to your point, mineral breaking up probably like deflated my balloon a bit. You know, we had a really good momentum with Fitri's Humor Boy's Life, Mineral. And then that breakup, as I look at our catalog here, like, yeah, like my balloon was definitely deflated. And so I think that led to kind of a fizzle of the label. I will say Jonah's One Line Drawing, that album, I saw Jonah play live and it was like a soulful experience. And I went up to him right after, and I'm like, I, I got to do something with you. I thought it would do better. I was really surprised it didn't. And then my, you know, my bright eyes, I've always known Connor. Like I've been in the Kansas and Nebraska scene for my entire music career. I know early on, I remember him sending over whatever the demo, and I didn't really understand or want to put out this Connor Ober stuff. And then I started getting it a lot more. And so I started stalking him a little bit. And then when he offered to do the split with Neva DeNova, I was ecstatic. I mean, Bright Eyes music, like Mineral, Bright Eyes talks to my soul in a way that many other things can't. So I thought that I was ecstatic about that. I thought that would do really well. And it did decently, but it, it uh, and not, not Mineral levels by any means. Which one, which release was this? What year was that with the Bright Eyes? This was 2004. Oh, okay, that's number 40. That's like your second to last one. Did you have any kind of concerns? Because I know Bright Eyes is known, he was, he's bipolar. It's, it's very well known that he has a hard time with, like, at that time, just like everything. Was there ever a concern when you were getting into business with him where you were like, this is kind of a wild card? No, and... I- Listen, I, I always got along with, with Connor. I understand that, you know, he may, may have been messing with uh, some entertainment that wasn't as good for his body. But um, <laughs> That's a good way to put it. Yeah. But he, <laughs> I, I, I always got along with him, and I really, I, I think he's, he, was the, he was the new Bob Dylan uh, in my mind. And he just had a special way of, like, the, his music and – the way he put the songs together and the lyrics, it, it connected with me. And that was one of those where like, I, I got to work with a guy. I mean, some of his songs are still like, got a few of his in my uh, Desert Island mix. Like, <laughs> That's a good point. He, That's a good he, point. he might, yeah. Did, did you kind of find as you're getting older though? I mean, I was talking to someone the other day in an interview and I was like, you know, I just realized that the majority of new bands when they get signed they're young. They're in their teens, early 20s. As a label, if you're in it for a while, you personally are getting older, but the new bands that are coming out are most likely not in their 30s or 40s where they have a better perspective on life. They're in their late teens, early 20s where you're saying you have to have this conversation with them being like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm sure that could get draining as you're getting older and having have these new conversations with these young crowds where you're, the, the age gap is just increasing. Yeah, yeah. And, and listen, I, um, I got into the music business because I was really passionate about it. A lot of that passion got sucked out of me and not necessarily because of bands, but because of the game. What do you mean? Trying to get a band to be known and then let's say to get signed for a major label, like you gotta, you gotta create the excitement. You gotta get it in the right people's hands at the right time. You have to be at the, you know, the right magazines or the right stations. You gotta build hype. Right. And it got really tiring. Uh, it got really tiring for me. I didn't love the music part as much anymore. And I was losing my passion for just sitting around and listening. Like I would, you know, some of the albums, let's go back to the Boys Life album. Like how many times did I just listen to that on repeat and be blown away? I just didn't have that anymore. And that wasn't good at all. And so that's why I started searching or when the Saul Goodman thing started, started doing really well, it was providing more intellectual fuel for me. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed growing that business. 
I love creating stuff. And listen, I, I really adored creating Crank. I did not do everything right, but I have obsessed over my mistakes and have tried to make it better as, as the years go on. And with each new venture, I feel so ridiculously fortunate that I got to work with every one of the bands that I got to work with. I feel humbled that they created such an impact or some of them created such an impact on people. And I get it because they created, I, I was just like the biggest fanboy, right? I, like they created that impact on me. And what I love doing is being able to listen to that vicious humor or boys life or mineral, whatever the album was before everybody else and be like, holy crap, people are going to feel the same way I do soon. And I am so excited for that. Yeah. And, and they did. Yeah. And I, I feel so ridiculously fortunate to have that. I don't love the way it fizzled out, but it did. So before we get to that, you said that there was things that you dwelled upon that you did mistakes. You totally don't have to answer this. I just figured I'd ask. Was there something that you really grappled with at the end of the label that you finally were like, okay, I'm good with it now? Oh, that I'm good with them, with whatever the mistakes are? Yeah, like like one of them where you were like, okay, this is something that just constantly bothers me where I wake up sometimes and I'm like, fuck, I'm still thinking about this. Has there been one or a couple that you've like like let go of? Uh, no, I don't let go of my mistakes that easily. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sounds like all of us. <laughs> yeah, so not, not really. I mean, I've learned from them, but listen, there were certain things that I did. I was trying to juggle everything as, as a label owner. When I was the head of finance i was the the head of pr i was the head of a and r manufacturing you name it you can't do that and do it all effectively and that's one of the things that i learned along the way is is i can't do everything i can't do everything alone and i tried to and uh and it didn't work out for me and my mental health in that like you know because i look back on it and, and if i were to do it again would i do it differently I'm not sure because I learned a ton about myself and I wouldn't want to miss the opportunities I had with, with the labels. There are certain things, yeah, operational things I, I may have done differently, but um, there was no great, like I'm, I'm, it is what it is now. I lived my history. It's the history. So I'm not stressing as much over it now, but, uh, but it's still there in the back of my mind. How did the label finally end? I stopped putting out bands. Um, the <laughs> the end <laughs> the the end so uh yeah i closed the door i walked away no i realized that we're losing too much money and i can't afford this and i i can't afford to pay the bands and i've got to stop and after you know icarus line and get said and eva denova like they just didn't sell and i also realized for however awesome Fred Emery is, and he's awesome, that he's not an entrepreneur that can build a label. Right? And that's the role I put him in, which was unfair for him. And so it just wasn't growing. And I had to make a decision of what do I do? And so I decided I'm just going to, will continue to sell. I hired somebody to continue to do mail order and, and, and promote and try to get mo you know, soundtracks and things like that, but that I wasn't going to sign any more bands at the same time, you know, my marketing agency was doing very well. And, and I then built up a essentially a corporate like career. Did you feel a sense of relief when you just stopped the label? <sighs> Part of it is, I, it's complicated. Part of it is relief um, because I was stressed. I had a label and my job was to find the right bands and I didn't have time or the desire to do the hustle that's needed in order to get that done. And I didn't have the money to hire somebody who was great at it. There was more competition out there in it. So it became increasingly more difficult. So I was relieved that I told myself it's okay. I'm not going to do this anymore. I was disappointed that my expectations of what the label, what I wanted out of the label, I wanted to be epitaph. And I didn't get there. Part of that was definitely some uh, look at self-worth. Why is the website still up? That's a good question. 
I, I don't know. In fact, when I went to it 10 minutes into our call, I went to crankthis.com and I uh, didn't know if it was still up. <laughs> and it is. And I don't think, I heard it. I'm not sure, but I need to take it down. I mean, I think it's cool that it's up. I actually ordered a mineral sweatshirt from that, I think, in 2000. 9 2010 or something like that was the last time you were because you i mean sure you had a lot of merch just sitting around so you were just keeping that open to sell it sell it off right yeah yeah but it's been uh i mean 2010 sounds about right so i had hired a a woman to handle all the mail order that may have been until 2012 okay because i remember i got it and i got like a mineral sticker and then i was so excited I mean, 10 years after the fact of me finding power of failing, and then 10 years later, I'm buying a sweatshirt. But I think when I went on your site, I was I was clicking onto the store like, oh, maybe I could buy another one. It's like, sorry, this has been closed. I'm like, son of a bitch. Yeah. Yeah. I um, Sorry about that. So yeah. I, my, my <laughs> friends make fun of me because I don't know. Did, did you ever get the mineral shirt with the face the kids? You know, it's a blue shirt with silver. I got the one with like, it was like a smiley face or something, I think. There are two. It's like clip art of a boy and girl, and it says mineral on the top. You is it blue? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was a blue, like a navy blue hoodie. Oh, okay, yeah. So I have that. The, that T-shirt everybody loved, and I do. I actually still have one that I wear when I go to sleep. And my, my, I was at a friend's place the other day, or I'm visiting them, and uh, I was wearing. He's like, "How many of those freaking shirts do you have?" I'm like, this is the best shirt ever made. It lasts for like 20 years. <laughs> but so I was cleaning up, I was cleaning out the garage the, uh, this weekend and I found uh, five more. So I'm oh, good for shit. the rest of my life. <laughs> oh, wow. What did you print on? Was it like Gildan, even though I hate Gildan? I think it was Gildan. Like, no, the early, the second running was Gildan, which weren't as good. I forget what the first was, but it's like the, it's like the most comfortable, softest t-shirt ever made. That was like when American Peril was good. That was like early two yeah. thousands. Uh, yeah, uh, but I look. I'm looking at it online. Yeah, the boy and the girl clip art. Yep, that was the sw- that was the hoodie that I had. Yeah, Jeremy did that design. It, it's classic. Yeah. Before I ask the last couple questions, um, I let you go. Was uh, at, at that time though before the label ends. Even though we we finished the label ending, was there like labels that were around you that you were watching, where like where you were thinking I could replicate what they're doing, or I should stay away from what they're doing to keep the label going. No, so the uh, what was the label that put out Dashboard Confessional? Do you remember? Vagrant. Vagrant. So Vagrant was coming up. I think they started after me. Yeah, I just interviewed Rich, and he was telling me the whole story about like that whole beginning and how crazy it just popped off. Yeah, I need to listen to that interview because I was definitely jealous of them. That was one where I was like, I should be doing, I should be in their position. And why am I not doing what Vagrant's doing? Why are they getting the bands and I'm not? And so I definitely, I respected them. We got along. We didn't talk much, but we always, you know, we're fine with each other. But I was very, very jealous and in my own mind, highly competitive with them. That's the one that jumps out. But others, like I wasn't thinking, oh, let me switch. There was no like goal of i'm an emo label or it was like i just want to find music i love and as it turns out there's a theme in music i really love short answer no (laughs) yeah because there's some labels out there that were paying attention to how other people were marketing and they're like oh we should you know kind of advance in that idea or because it felt like every label was doing their own thing kind of i bring this up a lot like hopeless started putting all their cds in the the foil packs so they could stand out in the shelves and you know, some people would do some crazy, I don't know, some people would just have different displays or do something different to stand out. But um, I don't know, it's always interesting well, to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, two things. I already forgot the second, so I'll start with the first. The uh, we When Boy's Life, when we put out the Boy's Life, I think it was the, the Christopher Fun Drive Boy's Life 10-inch, they wanted to do letterpress. They had a guy in Lawrence, Kansas, and so we did a letterpress jacket, and it looked insanely good. And so I did that with Don't Forget to Breathe. I ended up doing that again with Bright Eyes, Neva DeNova 10-inch, because I, I thought it's really special. It's like a collector's item, and I, it was gorgeous. And so that was one thing we did. Another thing, I don't know if, how many people know this, but with uh, the 
mineral Jimmy Eat World Sense Field seven inch. So when you you know you go to manufacturing and you tell them what color you want it, you know, give me a black vinyl or red vinyl or whatever. So I went to them and I said, not only do I not care the color, I want it mixed. And so I want you to do separate runs, like with whatever remaining colors you have of the last run you did, then run mine again. And so we, they are, they come in different colors. Oh shit. Yeah. And so there's, uh, I don't know, 12 different colors. Wasn't gray one of them? Gray was one of them. There's like a gray and white. Yeah. That was my, that's what my friend had. I remember that. Yeah. So I, I'm like, it's like Happy Meals, collect all the colors. But what a value that has on it now though. Yeah, completely. Yeah. And I, uh, and then, you know, some of the others, like I think the boys life, Chrissy front drive are hand numbered. We didn't do that with the bright eyes cause we knew there would be too many sold, but there's some neat stuff that, that we did there. I love that stuff. Like no one does that shit anymore because I mean, even though vinyl's back and do like hardcore, I'm like staring at my collection right now, which is it gets increasingly bigger every single month just because I'm addicted. There's no one. Everything's so digital that when people do something that's physical now, I feel like there's so much more value on it. And thinking back at the time where you're doing this stuff, that even makes it even bigger to me. Like someone would take the time to just add a personal touch where it's 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 yours almost when you get it. Yeah. Yeah. The personal part I think is awesome. By the way, one other thing that I thought was hilarious and it actually made a big impact. So during this early time when I was doing the whole Dave and Goliath, like when screw the major labels were better and mineral had just come out. I had, I did a whole round of magazine ads for like four months where I took uh, the, the press shots of Michael Bolton and Kenny G and I think in sync and it just said, stop the insanity on it. <laughs> and then it had the crank logo on the bottom. <laughs> and I ended up getting cease and desists from Sony and a couple other labels. And I, I think I still have those because it's like, awesome. I, I've made it. Like they care. They're scared of me. They care about me. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking crazy. Was it scary at all when you got those letters or you were like, fuck yeah. Well, my sister's an attorney, so I'm, I, and my stepmother's an attorney, so I'm like, uh, do I need to be scared of this? And no, it's just a letter. They're not going to do anything. And so I, I, you know, I do the, ah, sorry, I, I booked all the ads for the next three months. Eventually, you know, I had a series of like three or four. And so I was able to go through the series and I got maybe a couple letters and I, I, I thought it was, it was great. I wanted them to talk about me. And so that was the purpose. Get them angry and get people to talk about it. That's pretty punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so before I ask the last two questions, is there a story that you've always wanted to tell that you've never told in an interview and you can tell it now? Oh, I think I already told them all. <laughs> I was gonna say, I was yeah. like, I think you've gone through a huge list of them, you know, so I was like, I mean, he, he might have done this already. Yeah, no, you, I, uh, you caught me at a time, I haven't done a crank interview in uh, six or seven months and, you caught me at a time where I've just spilled it all. So I think uh, there's a lot that I've said that I've never said in any other interviews. So there you go. Nice. That's almost like when you're talking about the the labels where they're doing something and you want to, you're like, oh, I want to do that. I, I've been, when I interview someone who I know has been interviewed a lot, I'm like, I know they're probably answering the same questions and I know I'm probably asking the same things, but I always want to find something different where it just makes it a little bit more unique to what this, you know, the conversations. And also where you're not like, Oh my god, I just fucking have to tell this story again and again and again. Like I can understand where that could just get monotonous. Yeah, but no, you, these are uh, this is a good chat, so I appreciate it. Cool, man. All right, so uh, I will let you go. So last two questions before I let you go. Uh, number one, what would you like to plug? It could be about you. It could be about something a friend is doing that you want to give some light, shed some light to, or it could be about both. I mean, a plug. It's not really uh, probably appropriate or cared by anybody here, but. Uh, I am now in the, I have a newsletter about helping people build better companies and be better leaders. It's called by title only. So by title only dot com, And it's kind of funny and it's also uh, insightful. So if anybody is looking at building anything, whether uh, a company, a record label or a department, go sign up. It's free. 7,000 people subscribe. That's shit. That's all. How long ago did you put that up? Started it, started it for real about two years ago. Damn, seven thousand people. Yeah, so far so good. Fuck, man, that's a, that's amazing. 
Shit. Yeah, I signed up to What's the, uh, the website they go to? Bytitleonly.substack.com. Okay, I'll put a link to my show notes when I, when I launch this. All right, last question. What scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? <laughs> be authentic, be myself. You know, it, it's, the scene was was all about we don't care what the mainstream is or what people are telling us to do. We're just going to do what we want to do, what feels right for us. And I was really attracted to that scene because of that. People can be who they want. And I definitely, that is definitely at the core of my life.